let's turn our Bibles to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, we'll look at verses 5 through 9, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. The title of the message is, It's Time to Do More. It's time to do more. It's time to do more. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Brother Jay, can you pray for the message? Possible because of what you did on Calvary's cross by shedding your precious blood to wash all our sins away. We ask you that you'll meet with us, Lord. You don't need us, but we need you. We ask you that you'll fill Pastor Jay with your Holy Spirit, give him liberty, give him power and unction from on high to speak your word clearly and open our hearts, minds, and ears to your word. Help us not to be distracted by the things that are happening outside. Help us to wholly take your word in our hearts so that we will not sin against you. We ask you that you'll be with those who are not doing well uh, physically, that you'll touch them, heal them, Lord God, so that they can come next time. Uh, we give all the glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 It's time to do more. As human beings, we are bare minimum people. You, know, you always tend to do up to that minimum. You know, people who work, a lot of times workers, they just do bare minimum. If they need to meet quotas, they get to that quota and stop. And students as well, you know, unless you grow up in a very strict education oriented, you know, a lot of families in Asian countries, you know, they're like that. But if you have a, like a freedom, you know, more carefree and your parents leave you alone when it comes to education, People will usually do bare minimum. And it's a bare minimum society. You know, when you look at your Christian life, many times you only do bare minimum or even less. I mean, you tend to just read the Bible, just bare minimum. Especially young people, you read three chapters a day. You need to get signature from your parents and you don't want to get you know, scolded by your parents nor you know, you know, teachers or pastors. So you do your bare minimum. You pray, you do bare, bare, I mean, super bare minimum. You just kneel down for a little bit, or you might just you know, close your eyes and say that you prayed, and then you think you're OK. It's a human character where if you don't love to do it, you only will put out bare minimum just to pass, you know, just to get over that you know, passing grade. But as Christians, you shouldn't be a bare minimum Christian. And when you realize what the Lord has done for you and all the things that you know, you've experienced and you've gone through and all the blessings that the Lord has brought you along the way through his infinite grace and everlasting mercy, you need to do more. I mean, each day, we, as it goes by and as it passes by, we get closer to coming of the Lord. And, you know, based on everything that's happening, you know, it's pretty imminent, right? We don't know the exact time, but Lord's going to come back soon. And if you know that and you've been preached upon and you studied through the Word of God, I mean, shouldn't your life change a little bit? Yes. I mean, even just a tiny bit? I mean, why are you always same or always digress? Oh, yes. 
I mean, for some of you, you might say that, oh, yeah, I put my time for the Lord. You only do it because you're forced or because of your pride or because people are looking at you. You know, you're looky-look Christians. And the worst thing about traffic, especially in Southern California, it's, it's already bad as it is. If there's even a little tiny accident, right, on the freeway or regular street, people just slow down. They have to see what is causing, you know, this slow, you know, traffic. And many times it's like nothing. You know, it's like little bumper hit, right? You know, someone's changing their tires and people get disappointed. Oh, man, I thought I was going to see something bigger, you know, something, you know, worse, right? I mean, that's pretty bad, too, thinking that, you know, I, I wish, you know, I saw as long as people don't get hurt or maybe you want to see people get hurt, right? And then see a major accident scene and start telling other people. But it's funny, though. If you guys saw something crazy or terrible accident on freeway, you know, you got to tell your family right away, your friends. You know, did you hear that news, right? You saw it on the news, right? Actually, I went through it. I saw it. You know, and then you start describing it. And amazingly, when people hear about those accidents or terrible things, they're very attentive. You know, when something terrible happens to people, people get drawn to it, which is a bad thing. You know, that's why there are so many gossip going on in the church, yeah. right? You know, brethren hurting each other because they just want to, you know, immerse themselves in, you know, gossips, you know, what's going wrong with other person's life. And it's very prevalent in any, any Bible-believing church. I mean, you have to grow and you have to start doing more. You got to stop wasting your time, you know, with needless and worldly, lustful, fleshly things. Think about it. If you and I reflect our Christian life, for the past year, you know, was it fruitful? Was it really worth it? Did you actually do what you were supposed to do? Or were you just a bare minimum Christian? You are just a looky look Christian. You just wanted to show, but inside, you're no better. Inside, you're deteriorating. Inside, you're being polluted. And inside, you're drying up. And inside, you know, your conscience is really, really, it's like, you know, in the book of Acts, right? It's seared with a hot iron for some of you Christians. As if this, you're prone and you're not prone to any sin or per se, like it doesn't bother you anymore. You're to the point where certain sins don't bother you anymore. You know, that is very dangerous. Yes. You're like You don't care, you know, even if it's a little one like lies, right? You start lying to your families and this doesn't, it's not a big deal to you anymore. So you say, you know, common thing people say it's a white lie. So, you know, it's not gonna hurt anybody. You know, like your wife goes, did you do this? And you're like, yeah, but you didn't do it. But you're inside, you're like, I'm going to do it. That's, that's why I say yes. And a lot of times people answer it that way. You know, did you do it? You're like, yes. And then, <laughs> Give me some time, you know, and don't come into my room or don't come into, you know, don't check me out, right? And that is like a repeated cycle in your life. When the Lord tells you and then you get pricked and then you get convicted through preaching, you know, praying, you know, through the word of God. Amen. And you're like, okay. Yes, Lord, I'm going to change. Yes, Lord, I want to be more committed to you know, this Christian living, Bible-believing ways. And I want to become more holy. I want to live a Bible-believing Christian life. And you say yes, but it never shows in your actual personal life. You don't do much, right? You and I are very, very, very well known for wasting our time. I mean, the Bible says redeeming the time for the days are evil, right? But you don't redeem your time. You don't buy time to do things for the Lord. Instead, you buy time to do more wasteful things for yourself. When you're playing with your cell phones, right? I mean, are you really doing the works of the Lord? 
Right? I mean, are you really getting edified when you're using your cell phone that much? I mean, I wonder. You know, I grew up in days we had no cell phone, right? The only internet connection we had was that, you know, AOL, and it screams at you, you know, as it tries to connect to the internet. And every time, you know, it tries to connect to the internet, you thought someone was like, you know, screaming, yelling, or, you know, something was happening, you know, back in those days. And you live pretty well without the cell phones. But you had less distraction. You actually have more communication. You actually were talking to people more. You're less dependent on technology. You were out there more as kids playing, you know, baseball, soccer, whatever it is. But nowadays, whether you're a kid, whether you're an adult, all you need is that phone, cell phone. You, know, I mean, you just sit there or lie down on the couch or on your bed. And you just play with your phone the whole time. You know, wasting your time doing social media stuff, you know, that's unnecessary. I mean, honestly, are you saying that you're spending 24-7 listening to all of the Bible-believing preachings, you know, listening and getting convicted for hours and hours each day, and you know, talking to people, chatting to people, chatting with people about salvation? you know, about KJV, you know, godly stuff, you know. Don't fool me and don't fool yourself. You know, you don't do it. Instead, you're on various, you know, YouTube channels or, you know, nowadays TikTok is big, right? And then you try to get some joy out of looking at a bunch of people doing stupid stuff, you know, trying to increase their views. And then maybe you're part of the gang. Maybe some of you guys here, you know, your goal is to, you know, Try to make yourself famous or make yourself more known amongst you know, worldly people and worldly friends where you, know, you do some you know, weird stuff, you know, out of the ordinary stuff, and so that you could get more views out of it. I mean, is that really you know, edifying yourself or is that really edifying the brethren or is that really you know, bringing glory to God? You're not doing more, you're doing less for the Lord Jesus Christ after what he has done for you, right? Let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 1. When we say, when we look at verse 5, and beside this, and beside this, it just tells you that getting saved isn't everything, especially to Christian life. Obviously, you get saved. You're saved from hell. Now, you have eternal life. However, some people get saved and never grow. They never do anything for the Lord, even though there is more. That's why beside this, you know, look at verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I mean, the, obviously, this is promise for saved Christians. I mean, if, you, if you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have these great promises that if you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, like John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. Also, we have Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. These are great promises, right? You get the divine nature by trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Yes. However, majority of the Christians, 90% of the Christians, don't do anything and never grow after they get saved. They just don't do anything for God. I mean, who are you? You're just a sinner saved by grace. What are you doing? for the Lord Jesus Christ on a daily basis. Bible is, I mean, 1 Peter, theme of the 1 Peter is knowledge of God. You know, knowledge of God. Has the knowledge of God grown in your life? Do you know more about scripture today than last week or month ago or years ago? Or are you still stuck at the same place, right, down there? 
you know. Maybe some people might have gone to Bible college and got your degrees, whether it's a PBI, you know, Pastor Kim's church, right? Where are you? Did it digress? Right? You thought you were doing more for the Lord by going to PBI and this Bible-believing schools and gotten your degree and, you know, you got your knowledge and stuff. But you don't do more. You always be, feel like, I've done enough. I mean, what kind of attitude is that? If Lord said, you know, when he was going through those hard times, and I've done enough, I'm just going to stop. Where would you and I be right now? Right? Yes. It's like, when you, you know for sure you have the energy, and you know for sure you have time, and when you know for sure you can do it, but you tell yourself, start doing that self-pity. Like, I've done enough. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. That's enough. I mean, is that you? Are you that type of Christian where you say, oh, I don't want to read that part. I'm happy with verse 4. I'm happy with the promises of, you know, John 1, 12 and you know, Romans 10, 9, 10, 17, 13. I'm happy with that. I don't want to go to verse 5 where beside this, where you know, you know that there's something more to it, where you have to do more, where your character, your Christian character has to grow. But you stop there. That is a pitiful life. That's a wasteful life. That's a prodigal life. That's where you don't have joy in your Christian life. That's where you don't have peace in your Christian life. That's where you, all of your work that you think you're doing will just burn up at the judgment seat of Christ. It's like everything, you're, you're, you're like working with all this trash and you're gathering more trash, right? You're no better than, you know, someone, you know, homeless person on Fifth Street in downtown LA, spiritually speaking. All you're gathering is, is just, you know, this trash after trash, needless things, you know, that's not going to help you in any way as Christian. And when it's time to, you know, judge whatever you have done for the Lord after you got saved, whether it's good or bad, it's just going to burn up. And you have nothing to show for as a Christian. And especially you're attending and listening to Bible-believing you know, local church, pastors and preachers and missionaries, you definitely have no excuse. You definitely have no excuse more than anybody else. People who are deceived, you know, you could always give an excuse, you know, oh, man, at least, you know, they didn't know, you know. And they say, I didn't know. I mean, if you seek the truth, the Lord's going to show the truth. And now you have the truth. And you don't do anything about it. I mean, are you, do you ever have that conviction and, you know, push and desire to do more for Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you always the type of person, I've done enough? You know, I do our internet ministry. I do, you know, teaching ministry. And you know, I preach, you know, I've done enough. Bad attitude. One day you're not going to do that anymore. God doesn't want people like you. God wants people whose heart is always sold out and always willing to do more and more for the Lord. You know, when you see you know, Bible-believing preachers and missionaries where there are a lot of fruit, they are not satisfied at where they are when it comes to doing something for the Lord. They constantly want to do more for the Lord. Obviously, you know, you don't want to do it as because you want to be a showy, you know, person or you want to get some fame. Not that, but because you want to do something more for the Lord out of the pure heart. When was the last time you actually had that kind of desire, like burning, you know, desire, right? Where you have passion to do more for the Lord. Like literally beside this, right? 
And then with all diligence, you want to grow your faith each day more and more. When did you even have that kind of mindset? Was it after you got saved, which was like years and years ago? Or was it more recent? If you were more recent, your life wouldn't be where you, like, you are right now, right? As a pitiful Christian, as an aimless Christian, as a joyless Christian, you know, doing unfruitful things, having no fruit for Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that's who you are, and you have to admit it. The sad part is that people don't want to admit it. Instead, they just want to argue and get angry. And you're that, I mean, many of you guys are like that. Instead of truly recognize what's wrong with you, you always tend to try to look at other person's fault and then reverse it and then justify your actions. He does it. She does it. I mean, it's a common saying. I mean, if they... They jump up the cliff. Are you going to jump up the cliff? Obviously, the answer is no, right? But you go back to it all the time. Oh, my brother did it. My sister did it. That brother did it. That sister did it. Who, who is your standard? What is your standard? Even as a Bible believer, you say, I believe in the King James Bible as a perfect word of God. You know, this Bible it's my final authority, but you don't live like it. You don't act like it. It's just all talk. Because you never take time to do more. You never take time to grow. Do you even know the order of the books in the Word of God? Can you name all the minor prophets, major prophets, from Genesis to Revelation, all 66 books? Can you even say it, name it? How long have you been going to church? They're like, oh man, I don't, I don't know those order because I don't really read those sections. You know, I don't think they're that important. I mean, every word of God is important. I mean, do you take it seriously? Do you take your, you know, Christian walk seriously? Your Christian warfare seriously? That's why after you get saved, you, you need to start growing. And it's not about, you know, never doing anything for God. It's always about doing something for God. You are to give all diligence, right? You got to give all diligence. I mean, do your best, right? Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto man. You have to work hard at it, you know, as a Christian. You work hard for some things that you love to do in your life. If you love sports, you're going to do, you know, a lot of work into it. Maybe, you know, young people you're in a, or older people. I mean, if you are in a sports club or sports team and you really love it, whether it's basketball, baseball, or football, or any other sport, you're going to tennis, you put your time into it, and you're going to really work hard at it. If your passion is, you know, playing music, you know, piano, violin, or whatever it is, you're going to put your time into it, and you're going to put hard work into it. And if you love your work, working on a presentation that you like, or project, or program that you like, you're going to put your time into it. You're going to pay attention to it, and you're going to spend more time doing that thing. But when was last time you had that kind of commitment, that kind of passion, for the word of God, doing something for the Lord. You know, I know some people, you know, they're super excited. A lot of zeal for God, especially when it comes to doing street ministry, going out there, doing street preaching, you know, like visitation, because you really love it. You want to see souls get saved, but above all, you're doing something for the Lord. However, for majority, you don't really care. I mean, do, you, do you care enough to you know, pass out a track at every moment? Right? Again, 
we have thousands of tracks you know, freely available at our church for you to grab and pass out at any opportunity, right? Unless you're a super isolated person, you just live by yourself and you never go out of the house. But if you do go out from time to time, if you go to market, if you go to restaurant, if you go to school, if you go to work, along the way, if you put in gas, you're going to have opportunity. Why is it that it never crosses your mind? Why is it that it's not a big deal when you don't do something for the Lord? Right? You have every opportunity to leave a track here, give a track to someone. You know, that might be their only opportunity to get saved. And then you got to work hard at it, right? You got to pay attention to, but you don't do it. Because growing, doing more for the Lord is not that important to you. Then, when we look at the you know, rest of the verses, the you know, text verses, it's not going to really be an impactful thing to you. Even though it's the Word of God, even though you confess that it is the Word of God, even though you confess that it is my final authority, you're going to be like, nah, you know, inside... You're just looking at your time. Oh, it's 1040 something. You know, pretty soon the message is going to end. You know, what am I going to do during break time? You know, what am I going to drink? You know, which cookies am I going to eat? You know, what type of person am I going to talk to? You know, what am I going to do? You know, you're already, your mind is already wandered away for some of you. Like, okay, you know, how's the traffic going to be when I, you know, try to get back home, right? And what's for lunch today? You know, I mean, you even go further. What's my dinner today? You know, or you don't even care. Like, okay, what am I going to do for the rest of the week? And all these thoughts are going through your, you know, tiny brain, right, in, at this moment. But I expect it. I, I mean, we're all same human beings. I expect it because of the pure percentage of people who actually do something for God. Me included, you know, majority of us, we're not going to do anything for God. When you're just saved, then you're just going to die as a saved person. Or if the Lord comes back, you'll be raptured, but nothing, nothing to show for in your life. You need to add to your faith, like what we read today. Let's look at verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And each of these characteristics are built on one another. There are seven of them. So don't try to hop, hop off, right? And then go to, oh yeah, I'm going to verse 8. No. Order, right? Do all things, you know, in a decent, a decent and orderly fashion. You don't want to be out of order. So virtue. Virtue is high moral standards and ethical principles, right? Do you have high moral standards and ethical principles. Even as Christians, it's kind of, you know, sad to see you're worse than, you know, non-Christians out there. I mean, you look at Jehovah's Witness. I don't care what their motives are, right? You see them? Very clean. Very clean. Because I, I know you know, a few of my coworkers and good friends are Jehovah's Witnesses. Very clean. Not too much blemish, but man, you look at so-called Christians, right? Hey, you know, I could have some drink. You know? Having a couple beers is okay. Hey, you know, I'm stressing out, so uh, and I'm just gonna have some good time with you know some joint here and there. You know, it's not gonna harm anybody. I'm just doing it to myself. Ah, yeah, this money. Mm, you know, tithe. Uh, it's, it's an old way of doing things, you know. You know, for new, new people like me, I'm just going to keep all the money, right? I don't need to give it to the Lord. Yeah, and, and you think it's okay. You see your kid breaking rules at the church, not doing what they're supposed to at home. You're like, oh, it's okay. My child is going through puberty. 
They could do whatever they want. There's no standard. Like husband and wife, you know, they're always, you guys are always needlessly arguing with, you know, petty stuff or lying about stuff. You know, like, honey, did you take the trash out? Yeah. Again, your yes is like in the future yes, right? <laughs> right? It's, it's not like something that has been done. Or even kids and parents. Kids ask their parents, hey, daddy, mommy, did you do what you said you were going to do? They're like, yeah, 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 I did, son. You know, I did, you know, daughter, right? And again, your answer is in the future. You know? If I said I was going to get this for you, I'll get it for you in the future. But, you know, time has already passed by. You don't keep promises. Promises are nothing in your life. I mean, I mean as a Christian, like, your, your commitment and, you know, promises that you make amongst each other to God, God forbid, I mean, you're con continuously making you know, false promises with the Lord and false commitment. You really need to you know, confess and get right. It's like nothing. I mean, as Christians, I know this is going to hurt some feelings, people who's listening, right? Like, yeah. Crit music, you know. Bad music, don't listen to it. How can you say, like, oh, yeah, rock and roll, you know, it gets me going throughout the day. It gets me pumped up to pass out more tracks and witness. Okay. You're, you're devil possessed, man. What do you think? Uh, uh, how do you think you know, that's, that's, that's going to work? Right? Your flesh and spirit is contrary to each other. And just like I say it all the time, Bob Joe Sr. said it's never right to do wrong in order to do right. It's not. Then why do you still listen to those bad satanic music with wrong beats, right? And you don't have virtue when you think contemporary Christian music, going to Christian rock concert is okay. It's That's not. Good. How is that a good standard, right? Get rid of the lyrics. How does it sound? It sounds like any other worldly music. Trash. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know by their fruits. So many, so many of so-called contemporary Christian, you know, music artists cross over to become a regular music yeah. artist. Yeah. You know? Search it. There are lists and countless lists of people. They were singing, oh, how I love Jesus, and start singing, oh, how I love you. Right? Like, oh, you know, I love the Bible. Like, oh, you know, I love your love letter, and blah, blah, and then going into this fleshly theme. Because... There's no high moral standard, there's no ethical principles, and there's no virtue. You need to have virtue. Go to verse 5. It says, "Why?" Well, so then, okay, you're grounded in virtue, and it goes to, and to virtue, knowledge. Knowledge. So knowledge comes after virtue. A lot of people have it backwards. A lot of people have it backwards. That's why so many of the newer Christians or younger Christians, they're such a proud, stubborn people. People coming out of PBI, they're like, I know more than Dr. Ruckman now. You know, you know, you know the way he taught about certain doctrines? Nah, nah, nah. You know, I know we have some people who actually says it, right? You know, I mean, I fear for them, right? I mean, but like, okay, I know more than you now. So, I'm better than you. I mean, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 says, Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. See, your knowledge needs to be tempered. It has to be in balance with virtue and charity. I mean, when we talk about this knowledge of God, you know, we're talking about you know, knowledge of the scriptures. So if you say, oh, yeah, you know, virtue, very important. You know, I work very hard. And then secondly, what about your knowledge? Has your knowledge of God increased? I mean, has it increased? It's not about just sitting there listening to message, right? It's good. It's not about, you know, just being in a Bible study. It's good. But however... 
has it increased? I mean, do you have more knowledge of God and more knowledge of the scripture? For some of you, you've been sitting at a Bible study and preaching for years, but you're still the same. Your knowledge never increased. You know why? Because you don't have virtue. That's why. You could be listening to 1,000 hours of right, great Bible-believing preaching, studying the Word of God, but if you don't have, you know, virtue, it's off or not. Because it's not going to change you. If the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil, and then you care about virtue, and then you care about the knowledge, then you're going to abstain from all appearance of evil. If you're not supposed to go to that place, you're not going to go. If you're not going to listen to it, you're not going to listen to it. If you're not going to see it, you're not going to see it. However, since you don't have virtue, it all goes out the window. You're just a wicked Christian with a lot of knowledge. And now all your goal is to put other people down or look people down. Like, oh, yeah. You know, I know some great doctrines because, you know, I learned from Dr. Ruckman, you know. I heard from, you know, Brother Peacock, you know, Brother Walker, you know, you know, Pastor Gene Kim, you know, now I know all these deep doctrines. You have zero ounce of virtue. And what do you do? When you see some Christian brother doing something wrong, you're the first one to attack, first one to get on it. You know? Like, he's not supposed to do that. She's not supposed to do that. I mean, everybody grows at a different pace as a Christian. And some people take takes more time. And some people need more nurture. But no, you're so good. You have all the knowledge. And then you think you have the right to go up to somebody or start criticizing people behind people's back. You know what? You know, Bible says in this verse, you know, you're not supposed to do this, right? But he or she is definitely doing it. What should we do about it? What are you going to do about it? You just started a wildfire. And it's going to be hard to contain it, and it's going to spread. And what's going to happen? Now there's going to be a church split, and you're the, you know, culprit. And of course, you know, you have to judge for it. Why? Because you have knowledge without virtue and charity. So work on it. You know, work on that virtue, right? Have that high moral standard. Have that high ethical principles. If you don't have it, you could do rest of the things in the scripture that we saw, but your life will never change. That's why, because, you know, top or foundation isn't right, your foundation where you don't have any moral standard or ethical principle, rest of them you do everything, but there's no change in your life. You're still same you, you know, same, you know, depressing, pathetic, you know, mentally drained down Christian. And that is not a way for a Bible-believing Christian to live their Christian life. Where is that virtue that's missing in your life? Then after knowledge, let's look at the Bible. And to virtue, knowledge, verse 6, and to knowledge, temperance. And this is part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? You know, it's uh, self-control and moderation. In uh, 1 Corinthians 9.25, it says, Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. You know, when temptation comes our way, right? You know, you're able to deal with it better. You know? And you have more self-control. And then you do things in moderation. Think about it. People who's, those, who doesn't have virtue, has only knowledge, right? And then do you think they will have like any self-control or moderation? Never. They're the one who's going to start, you know, criticizing every single person. And whenever they start sinning, they go all the way which is majority of the people, right? Even though Holy Spirit convicts you, Lord gives you way, you know, like 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No. There's no self-control. There's no temperance. 
You know that sin that you're committing is wrong, but you go through with it. And of course, you're going to, you know, rip, rip the fruit, right? You sow what you reap. I mean, you reap what you sow, right? That's checking what, if you guys are paying attention, right? You know, at least some of your facial expressions changed. You know, maybe you're paying attention. For some, you know, you don't care about this message, but I don't care if you care or not. Honestly, it's you and the Lord, right? I mean, if you do care, then you care. If you don't care, then you don't care. It's a free will society. You and I have free will to follow the will of God, follow the word of God, you know, follow the conviction of the Holy Ghost, or you just reject it and just be whoever you are, right? That's one thing that, you know, at a Bible-believing church like ours, we will not push you or hold your hand to do anything you know, because that's not from your heart. And as you listen to this message, just think about it. The virtue, knowledge, temperance. And the next thing, look at verse 6. And to temperance, patience. You get patience by going through trouble and hardships. And it's you know, well discussed in, you know, Romans chapter 5. Then you won't have patience if you, have, if you don't have virtue, knowledge, right, temperance. How are you going to have patience? You say, I want to have patience. There you go. Answer, virtue, knowledge, and temperance. Then you have patience. It makes sense. You know, I mean, God's word is perfect. It adds up perfectly, right? Amen. I mean, if you have virtue, knowledge of the scripture with charity and virtue, and you have temperance, then obviously patience is there. Patience will come along, right? You're going to go through hardships and troubles, but you're going to have patience. Many of you guys have no patience. Why? Because you don't have the first three. You don't have virtue, knowledge, and temperance. And of course, then when it's time for patience, you are not going to have patience. You're going to start committing sin after sin after sin. And you're going to be in a deeper hole. You're going to be in a deeper backsliding state. And after patience, let's look at verse 7. Look at verse 6. And to patience, godliness. People are like, I want to live a godly life. Here's your answer. Godliness is more than observing a list of do's and don'ts, right? It is thinking about God's thoughts. It is responding as if how Lord will respond. That's being godliness, right? You know, such a cliche. What would Jesus do? I mean, hey, you know what? It's right here, right? What would my Lord would do? You know what? You know, I want to... Think about how he would think, being more like him. Right? When do you ever make decisions based on how the Lord will make his decision? When was the last time each decision you made each day were based on godliness? Or was it for your own pleasure? Was it for your own glory? Was it for your own you know, selfish ways? And then, oh man, there are more good stuff coming along the way. Verse 7, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. I mean, Ephesians 4.32 says, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. You know why you're not kind to each other as a brother and sisters in Christ? Because you don't have virtue. You don't have knowledge. You have no temperance, right? You have no patience, and obviously you don't have any godliness. How can you be ever be, you know, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, and be kind to one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you? I mean, think about it. If a brother does a wrong to you, you know, but you know, everybody makes mistake. You know, but if they truly, you know, from bottom of their heart, guess right, I mean, 
why can't you forgive that brother? Right? Why do you have to be bitter for the rest of your life? Why? Because you don't have the first five. That's why. Simple as that. And you, in order to get to that level, you need to have that first five in order. Be ready. Don't say like, you know, I could forgive you. You know, I could forgive you. You know, as Christ commanded, you're not. You gotta be bitter, and you're gonna be living a, you know, horrible Christian life like that. And lastly, let's look at verse seven. And to broadly kindness, charity, charity. You know, Colossians three fourteen says, and above all things, above all these things, put on charity which is the band of perfectness. And then charity will definitely show in your life. It is, as they say, love in action. You, know? you will show God-like love through charity. And how are you going to get to that point? How are you going to get to that level? I mean, the Bible clearly says it. Virtue Knowledge, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. I mean, God wants these seven characteristics to abound in your life. I mean, it has to be there. You say, you know, I want to bear the fruit of Holy Spirit. I mean, think about these things, these characters. The reason you don't is some part of your Christian walk with the Lord and some part of your Christian life. It's not right with the Lord. That's why. Think about your virtue. Think about knowledge. How you treat the word of God. How you receive the word of God. Right? Do you have you know, virtue and charity that's together with you know, knowledge of God and knowledge of the scriptures? And do you have with that, right? You're going to have temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. It is time for you and I to reflect on our Christian life. It's time to reflect our heart, whether we are truly right with the Lord. If any part is not, it's time for you to get right with the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Father, you have given us the perfect word of God. You have saved us through the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to do more for you, Lord. Help us to grow. Help us not to just digress and just stay and just become a minimum Christians or looky look Christians. Help us to do something for you, Lord, from the bottom of our heart. Help us to build on these characters, Lord, like you mentioned. Help us to abide in these characters, Lord God. Heavenly Father, I pray that during this crazy last days, Lord, help us to be found faithful, Lord. Help us to do more for you. And I pray that you bless, you know, our missionaries' message and work, Lord, and be with their family as well, Lord. We pray for them, and we pray for people of Georgia as well. And I pray that you be with those who are under the weather or, you know, they're going through struggles, physically and mentally, Lord. Be with them, Lord. You know, heal them, Lord. Help them to get right, Lord. I pray that you bless the rest of the day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>